Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am sitting in for Laura Bradburn and I'm joined by Tony Haggerty and Jim Moore. Thank you very much for having me, guys. How are you? Very well, yourself? I'm good. Tony, it's been some time since I shared the stage with you two. So <laughs> I'm delighted, personally, on a personal level. I'm delighted with it. Um, and it's great to see you, Jim. Good to see you, uh, thank- boss. Good oh, to see you. It's Good. always an absolute pleasure. There is loads to talk about in the world of Celtic. Uh, before we do it, just a wee warning to anybody watching that uh, Tony Hager, you might have to go and get a delivery at some point during this. But you know what? We're just going to run with it, Tony, right? We're just right. going to run with it. All right. Uh, last night, you were just saying there, Jim, um, having been at the game, it was a cold one. Um, but mm-hmm. I think that there are certain games during a, a campaign where you don't think back to say, well, you know, had Hart scored in the last couple of minutes after being a draw. It's just a one nothing win. We, we scraped it in the end. Um, but my biggest concern really was the injuries to, to three of our starters. I think if anyone didn't think squad depth was an issue, they'll know now it's an issue. I think the last few games, you've only got to look at the bench. The bench has been quite threadbare and you can't see who's going to go and change the games. And uh, I was on two weeks ago and I think, the previous game was Dundee and I thought we were great against Dundee and since then we've had St. Johnson in the semi-final with Aberdeen Saturday Hearts last night and we've scraped three games by one goal and uh, it's a bit of a concern because we shouldn't be in that position we've been putting teams to the sword and uh, and last night I thought uh, I mean Hearts are obviously well, the third best team in the league they're a stuffy team good defensively every time you see Craig Gordon it brings back memories of what might have been last season if Peter Law hadn't chased him out the building, but hey ho. Uh, yeah, just a 1 1 0 is a great three points on the board, and I think we just have to keep in this, uh, do what the best we can up to up to January when hopefully we get reinforcements in. And uh, four points behind, if we can still be four points behind after the Glasgow Derby, I'll be happy with that because I think we've got a few tough games coming up, and the squad is, as I said, a bit threadbare. It's just about winning, and uh, I'm just a bit concerned that having three. One goal victories. This might this might catch up with us. Yeah, I had the, the same concerns. Uh, I, I look back on any kind of previous season where we've won the league, and there are certain games where you you win one nothing away at, at, at for Park, or you you beat Aberdeen one nothing at home. And last night I had the feeling of of that about it, but had Hearts, you know. Uh, on their final attack, scored that goal. We had no response because at that point, Tony, we'd already made three forced changes. Uh, and again, I don't think many Celtic fans would have ever thought this. When Tony Ralston went off, we looked like a different beast altogether. I, I thought that in the first half, most of our attack and play came down the right-hand side. Uh, but when Tony went off, that completely changed. And near the end of that game, when... You know, Boyce should have been penalised for attack on Montgomery. We'll come to the referee in later. Hearts could have nicked it. And I think that's my biggest concern. There are certain games here where we're just winning by the odd goal. And we don't have the back door completely locked yet. Although, defensively, that was that was a sound performance last night. I get your concern, but Hearts didn't score. Right? First and foremost, Celtic won one nil. They, they, they ground it out, as they say. They were very, very resilient last night. Celtic team in the past would never won that, Paul. You know, so I think you have to hand it to the manager and the players that, you know, there's a bit of resilience there. There's a wee bit of character, a bit of team spirit. And I get the fact that, yeah, had Hearts responded and scored, Celtic might have struggled to get their noses in front again. I get all that, but they didn't have to. You know, sometimes, <clears throat> especially this time of the season, it's <clears throat> well done. It's substance over style. And it's concerning the manager that, as Jim said, they're not putting the team to the sword because he mentioned the lack of ruthlessness last night. Mm. And I get that. But even when Hearts came into it, Celtic the last 10 minutes still created a clear cut chance when James Forrest went through and should have buried it. Right? So, you know, you, you weigh these things up. I actually thought it was, as much as the scoreline doesn't reflect it, I thought Celtic were all right last night. They were decent. You know, Rogic coming back into the side. Terrific. Starfelt, best game in the Celtic jersey. And this was a guy that you, you, weren't, you were surprised to see in the starting lineup. Yeah. You know, so, you know, we, you see things like that. But, you know, they are still winning. There's confidence building there, momentum. But on the 
the negative side it is the injuries to the players. Mm. And squad depth's always been an issue. It's always been an issue since the start of the season. So now we are really stretched and uh, we'll need to see what team lines up and substitutes bench will be on display at Tanadice. But you are concerned. And if Jota's out for any length of time, alarm bells are ringing because he's a big, big creative player for Celtic and makes things happen. You know, Ralston, when he went off, yep, you only need to look at Ralston's contribution last night. Takes a solo from Mackay. Mackay should have been booked. Two uh, minutes in. That, that was the first one. Yeah. Really, really bad, nasty, mm-hmm. crude challenge on his shin, right, which he never really recovered from. But again, Jim's talking about seven and eight valid contributions. Maybe it wasn't a seven and an eight, but he made the most valid contribution all night, which was to set up the winning goal for Kyogo. And no other striker other than Kyogo would have scored that because he's too quick. That's why everybody, that offside or not, nobody was sure because his movement and quickness, I thought, is just... Ralston fizzes that across. He knows he knows where to be. And before Andy would put their hand up, is he offside or what? The ball's in the net. Stick the ball in the net and ask questions later. Yes. And, and it's turned out to be the most important moment of the match. No, I'm, I'm happy with that because I just think at this minute in time you just need to knock them down like Skittles take one game as you go along and just keep winning if you can and stay in touch stay on the cocktails mm. until January if you well, can. I think you're right Tony but I also think my, my concern is I think the last three games have followed a similar pattern the first yeah, 20-25 20, minutes we've been really really good we put teams on the back foot we've made lots of chances and not scored and then it gets slower and slower and slower for me. And we make a million passes, but passes without a lot of purpose, passes without a lot of penetration. We don't create a lot of chances. And if Yota's out, he's the main guy who creates chances. So I'm just a bit concerned that, you know, well, yes, it's good to win. That's the main objective of the game. Absolutely, yeah. But I just... just I, I, that, do, you know, I yeah. think they can. They, there will be a day when you might come a cropper, i.e. a Livingston at home. Yeah. You know, so and Dundee United at home when you couldn't get the win either. So that, that, I also that, think it makes it. I, sorry, Tony, you. No, no, on you go. No, I also think the way we play makes it easier for teams to defend. Yeah. You know, I thought I thought Hearts last night. Yeah. You know, found it relatively straightforward to defend Aberdeen. Found it St Johnson the cup game. You know, because we play too slow. You know, we have to play a lot quicker to try and yeah. get behind them. And that's why I thought the Dundee the Dundee game was, was, was great. It was really high tempo stuff. We went we went at them. The three games since that, yes, we won, which is the main objective, but I just think we're making it a bit easy for teams. We just have to be a bit of, be a, bit of a higher tempo to the game. That's all. Another thing, just note also, I thought the fans were really negative last night, not, not all the fans, obviously, but you know, got in players back a lot because this is a a new team, it's a young team, and we have to get behind them. And, and Mikey Johnson get some abuse last night. I mean, he's not intentionally <laughs> trying to play badly. Uh, and I've always said with Mikey Johnson, I think it's really difficult if you're coming on with 20, 25 minutes to go and having to make a difference and go up to the speed of the game, I think to assess Mikey Johnson, I think he has to have a number of games in the team and then see what you know, then see what he's like. And if Yota's out, maybe this is his chance. But uh, I think we have to all get behind the team. And as you say, Tony, we have, to, we have to just stick on the coattails, get to January, and then hopefully we can get these reinforcements in to kind of help the big man along. There was a nervousness last night, Jim, because it was a yeah. pressure situation. It was just, you know, it was, you could hear the sharp intakes every time there was a a misplaced pass because everybody mm. was feeling for the first time a real bit of pressure there. You know, there I think that's always going to be the case. Really behind, like, yeah, yeah. So. you were sitting behind and a goal up, and it was pretty precarious. And then when Hearts had that period in the second half, yeah. it was very noticeable. You know, and there was a, there was that instant. Remember when Callum McGregor threw himself in front of uh, somebody, and then Starfield did the diving header. You know, and to you quote yourself, Jim, that a heart attack football. I think, and I think the Celtic supporters were was they having a heart attack every time Hearts came up the pitch. But I don't remember Joe Hart having any kind of safe to make. So you weigh that no, up. No, you? but but yeah, you know, you last Saturday Aberdeen with the header off the line with Juranovic, you know, so that's yeah. that's all it takes. And I've, I've said before that yeah. until you're three goals up, you're in that kind of endurance zone because it's only yeah. two. And then once once you get in that third goal, you're then into that, you know, enjoyment zone. You can sit back and enjoy it. And and just over the last few games We've kind of endured them because we've only been that one goal up, albeit you know we've looked pretty comfortable. But that's all it takes, and you know, yeah. and as you said, it's about winning games. As long as we're winning games, that's great. But I just have a wee feeling that this maybe catch up with us at some point in time. And if you drop more points, 
I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be hard enough as it is because I think fine margins this season. The other night was a late penalty kick uh, goal, and we had a late penalty kick a few weeks ago. And we missed that, you know. So they score, we missed. If you reverse those two, then we're top of the league in goal difference. So uh, you know, fine, fine margins, and that decision to you know change the penalty kick taker come the end of the season could be huge. So every game is vital, and every incident within every single game is vital, and that's and that's where we are. So. Uh, yeah, it's going to be tough, but just stick on the coattails. Stick on the coattails, as you said, Tony. I like the, the fact that you've used the word character, though, Tony, because I was thinking myself that there has been a few occasions this season where we haven't found a way. And uh, as much as we love the... By the way, I got this wrong last night. The rip-roaring, free-scoring, never oh, boring. Um, the most important part for me, and it always will be, um, is to win the game. Right. Yeah. You can add everything else... But to win the game is more important than, you know, getting beat 4-2, but you played well. And I think that there's been a few occasions, the two games against Livingston, we didn't find a way. Uh, Dundee United at one each, we didn't find a way. It wasn't for lack of trying. I mean, Yota, I think, hit the, the bar a couple of times uh, that afternoon as well. But in the last three games where it's been, you know, 1-0, 2-1, 1-0, although it's not been as pretty and as rip-roaring as we would like, we have seen a different side, I feel, to Angie's game. Although you wouldn't like to admit it, I think we have seen a different side. I think we have slowed play down, as Jim says, Tony. But with the view to getting the result, which really is all that matters at the moment. We He did say we're winning, but we're winning with a purpose. And that purpose is we want to win a title. So you've got to win football matches and you have to find a way. So, you know, and, and I've been pleased with the character. You can't have it always. We all want the rip-roaring, free-scoring, never boring in this free-flowing, fast-attacking football that Andy's promising to be hammering teams 3 now after half an hour, like they did at Easter Road. We all want that. But see when it's not possible, and it's largely not possible because of the way teams are playing against us, right? The way they're setting up against us. Jim says it might be easier to play against us. That's, that's fair enough. But, you know, the last three games, they have found a way to combat that. Mm-hmm. Granted, it's no pretty. But see, at the moment, it's substance over style. Right now, it's results to January till we can get more players in the building, till we get that squad depth that the manager wants. You know, you have to just, you know, it's it's results. You know, like, pretty football is great. It's a bonus. And, I, and I'm aware that Ange wants to play pretty football and win with style and a purpose. At the minute, you just focus on winning with a purpose. You know, just winning. And uh, that was my gripe at the start of the season when we weren't winning. You know, and the pennies drop, they, they are winning. So, as I say, you, you can't complain too much, you know, about what if Hearts did this and what if they didn't. You know, you have to just be positive and, and give the players that credit for that mental fortitude that the manager's instilling in them, that character, that belief, you know, because you watched Rangers the other night and you think they're there for the taking. But as long as Celtic have got their strongest squad available too, you know, so you, you see, and as Jim says, it is going to be fine margins. Yeah. Fine margins are going to decide this title. So that, that and that penalty, for instance, with Riff scoring, Jack and Marcus missing, you don't know how crucial that will be, but at the time, you, you were think, coming away thinking, I hope that doesn't come back to bite us, you know? And e- even a few weeks down the line, you're still thinking, in the final reckoning, you know? But, you have to just stay in it and they're showing a way of staying in it, which is good. I, I've been hearing Kevin Graham uh, all season talking about being within touching distance of Rangers come the turn of the year, come the Derby game at Celtic Park. Yeah. Is four points that margin, do you think, Jim? Is that the touching distance we're talking about come January? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's fine. That's only a couple of draws. You're going to lose four points. Yeah, I just think we I, I kind of... I think they've had a bit of a bounce for the new manager coming in. I think they looked a wee bit stale and uh, and they've managed to ground out results as well. Uh, they seem to be playing. I mean, I saw the game the other night. They didn't play particularly well then, but two games before that, I thought they played quite well. They've, they've got a far better squad depth than we have. We have to admit that, unfortunately, at this, this point in time. And they've got, you know, maybe they've got options that we don't have. And that's my concern. You know, we, we overly depend on Kyogo to score the goals and we that. <laughs> And they've got maybe two or three players that can score goals. So I'm just, I think it was a, 
the Aberdeen game on Saturday, when I looked at the bench and I just thought, there's nothing there. There's really mm-hmm. nothing there. And uh, I expected more from Forrest last night because I've been quite uh, down on Abada. And I thought Forrest played the Abada game perfectly last night. It was anonymous. Uh, so we need big contributions from guys like Forrest. I thought McGregor was outstanding last night. I mean, he was all over the pitch. He was making tackles. He was blocking. He was just he was, he was an outstanding performance last night. But Starfield was great. You know, I've said since the start, I think Starfield was a half-decent defender. It did look a bit ungainly at times. But to get back to the point, yeah, I think four points is fine. Once it gets on like seven and eight, then it becomes far too difficult. You then start to count down the games. Uh, I think we'll obviously have a game in hand after the after the cup final again. So that, you know, that could be seven. And psychologically, that's always difficult. Because that's, that's what happened last year. You know, when they got to something like, yeah. was it something like 13 points, you'll say, well, we've got three games in hand and we win them. Mm-hmm. And if, 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 if. But every game you play, when you're more and more points behind, even when you've got games in hand, it makes it far more difficult. And and the fans are a bit stressed out just now. If we go, you know, <laughs> 10 points behind with two games in hand, it's like, will we pull this back? Uh, so it's going to be a difficult season. But uh, yeah, I, I agree with Kevin. I think if, if we're within four points, that's certainly doable. Once it gets to maybe over six, you know, you're starting to question whether we can get it back or not. And I just think... Uh, we wouldn't have the reinforcements in before that second of January game, so just get by in that game. And I think, I think a point would only suit them as well. I think how they play, how, how we play, would only suit them in terms of they'll only sit back and hit, hit, hit us on the break. And I think, I, I think if they get the Celtic part with a point, they might be happy as well. So we want to win the game. It'd be great to win the game, take back in it. But let's just not lose the game. I know that might sound a bit negative to a lot of people, but yeah, we keep within four points, and then we get reinforcements, and then we make a real push after that. Yeah. One of the biggest frustrations is we, we welcome back Starfelt last night. We welcome back Beaton, who took his place on the bench. We're, we're bringing players back in, but we're losing them at the same time. And that, that was one of the biggest. And Tommy Rogic, of course, who we'll talk about, who's on the headline. Tommy Rogic comes in, makes a big contribution last night, but we lose a few. Um, and that really does uh, remind us, it's a stark reminder that we, we really don't have that that depth, unfortunately. The Mikey Johnson thing, let's talk a wee bit about that because, Jim, quite rightly, you could hear the groans of displeasure uh, on the three occasions, the at least three occasions, that breaks moved down when it got to Mikey. But at the same time, I think that, you know, his, his management, getting back into the side, playing 20 minutes here, 30 minutes there, that's really the only way you can manage him back into the side. When does it come to a point, no, Tony, so that he can get the confidence, so that he can maybe find a bit of form, that you give him a run of games when you've got somebody like Jota there? It might be um, fortuitous for Mikey Johnson, no one else, that, that Jota's out for a couple of weeks. No one else wants to see him out. But I think it's a you know it's a, di- a very difficult one when it comes to Mikey Johnson because he certainly needs the games. And it looks to me like he needs the confidence as well. Um, however, his performances, I don't think, are deserving of that so far. No, the manager watches him at training every day and clearly doesn't trust him to start football matches for Celtic. You know my thoughts on Mikey Johnson, I just don't think he'll cut it. And he, and he never has and he never will, in my opinion. So that's that's where you can give him all the runner games that you want. I just don't think Mikey Johnson will produce. He's not got an end product. He's got a wee trick and a flick, but no end product. And every big game that he has had his chances... He's not really performed. He's came up with a couple of cameos where he's looked good and everybody says, oh, that's that's the Mikey Johnson we want to see. And then when he gets his chance, he, he, he doesn't produce. Well, you've got to produce. You've got to contribute at the highest level when you're playing for Celtic. And coming on and playing 20 minutes here and there isn't great, but it's an indication that the manager thinks, well, do you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm giving you time to be an impact kind of player, but you're not making any kind of impact. You know, so it's, uh, for me... I just I just think Mikey Johnson's future lies away from Celtic. I, I really do. Uh, where, where, wherever that is, it's fair enough. But I don't trust him to to do anything or, or create anything or, or be a Celtic player of the future or a star of the future. You know, so I would uh, I would look at maybe loaning him out or maybe using him as a, a make weight to maybe try and get somebody like Nisbet or Boyle from Hibs or something like that. Plus. Mickey Johnson plus cash, something like that, to see if but why would Hibbs bite on that, you know? But, but you have to you have to ask questions like that because I just don't think he, he has it to contribute at Celtic. Uh, I don't think he deserves abuse, 
But I think last night was that was an element of the Celtic fans' frustration and panic and nervousness that was mm. engulfing the stadium at the fact that the lead was a slender one. It's precarious, and you know it, it, it reminded you of the the Vim Janssen season, didn't it? Where everything was just like, oh, oh no, no, we need to win this title. Very tense, yes. You know, everything mm. and it's going to be like that this season because of what's yeah. at stake. So this is going to be a season where you're going to be like up and down like that and you're going to have to strap yourself in. That's what it's going to be. So, but targeting Celtic players for abuse like that is never on, in my opinion. If you don't like them, fine, and they're not contributing, fine. But, you know, while they're on the pitch, you have to give them support and encouragement. But I uh, I just think that I'm just no a lover of Mikey Johnson. You can probably tell. And that, that's that's just that's my opinion and that. You know, I just don't think he'll, he'll he'll be the man that we want him to be. I think that's a fair comment, but I think also, unless he gets seven or eight games, you know, to see what he can do, because I think he's playing in a position on the field which is high risk. You either take players on or you don't. You just, you just play it safe. He at least tries to take players on. And I would say the best half an hour of football this season was Easter Road when he was on the left and Yota was on the right. Uh, I think he's got, he's got the ability... There and I just think we have to give him a number of games. And I just think any player coming on with 20 minutes to go, where the fans <laughs> the fans are dead nervous, mm. every misplays kick is a disaster. Mm. You need to be mentally tough to kind of deal with that. You're the guy that plays on. And I think if you're playing fullback or that will be my Gia wardrobe, all right? <laughs> Good luck with the wardrobe. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say there, Jim, is he actually going to build it? Because I, I can never figure out how to do these things. But uh, he's got I don't know if that would pass as an entertainment. He's got a wardrobe there. What is he I know. What's he needing another one for? Two wardrobes. It's for all the awards. <laughs> I think, uh, what was I saying? Aye, I think just uh, that was the best half hour of the season for me playing Yota on the right, Johnston on the left. And I think that. I think he's got the ability there. I think maybe there's a bit of lack of confidence there. I just think you have to be mentally tough to come on with 20 minutes to go in a really tight game and try and make a difference. And he tried to make a difference and didn't come off from him. And then all of a sudden there's like all these boos that he's getting. And I think, yeah, I think that's really tough. You know, really, really tough. And I'd, yeah. I'd like to see him make it. I think he's got the talent to make it. And it's a confidence thing. And in football, sometimes one game changes everything. You know, they play in the game in the second of January, they score a couple of goals, and all of a sudden he's, he's you know, He's a uh, Celtic stay becomes much more difficult, much more different than it is just now. So I understand Tony's point of view. I mean, there's players you like and players you don't like. I've got one or two that I'm not too keen on as well. So Mikey's not Tony's flavour of the month. Hey ho. But again, though, what, what it would do is it would also allow uh, Jota to switch on to the right. Now, we've spoken quite a bit this season, Jim, about a badder, um, the inconsistencies in his game. You bring Forrest back and he makes a real impact over a couple of games. And then last night wasn't his best. He probably should have scored two goals, mm -hmm. uh, the chance in the first half. Yeah, you know, the, the ball comes back to him at pace, but you would expect him to just slot it away at that stage. And Gordon mm -hmm. done pretty well as well to put him off. Um, and then in the second half, you know, you, you scored one of them and things are far more comfortable for you. Yeah. Yeah. Jota does look good on the right as well. And by the way, um, it's a point you made after the Livingston game when we were talking about the amount of crosses going into the box, I mean, at that point, over just the two Livy, Livy games, we were averaging 20 crosses per half into their box with no end product. Mm. Um, but you made the point, Jim, that a cross doesn't mean, mean to be, doesn't have to be, rather, a cross for someone to win an aerial duel. And last night proved that with Alston onto Kyogo. That was the perfect cross for Kyogo because he, he doesn't have that aerial prowess. I think it's about getting to the byline and cutting balls back, turning defences. That's that's why I've said before, I, I think we make it easy or easier for teams to play against us because I mean, these are all good players that we're playing against. They're not, they're not idiots, you know. So And, and if they're well coached and well disciplined and, and, and they mark the spaces and we just knock the ball about slowly and if we don't try and turn them and we don't shoot from distance and we don't try a lot from time to time, then, then it will make it easier for them. And uh, I was quite surprised at Forrest last night uh, and it just seemed to be that not not the fact missing the goals. I just it wasn't in it very much, you know. And it looked like no change from what it was when a batter played that, mm. that he wasn't getting the ball. I mean, Rolfson got a lot of the ball when he was on, but yeah. but Forrest didn't, and I, I just didn't understand that. 
You know, and we, and we tend to be actually be doing the right a lot more than the left last night. Uh, but my big issue is the fact that when we go down the left, Yota plays with his head up. Yota takes players over. When Yota gets the ball, you're thinking something's going to happen here. And the only issue I have with Abad, I don't think Abad is a winger because when Abad gets the ball, I don't expect him to beat players. And nine times out of ten, he'll, ten times out of ten, he'll play the ball back to Ralston or play yes. ball to the side to, to Ralston. And I think we need everyone contributing. I saw during the week that then Bailey's maybe back in training now, so maybe he could be an option as well. There's a young guy Moffat who plays for the B team. He's meant to be a decent winger as well. So maybe there's some options there. Not experienced guys that you maybe want, but uh, who knows? So I, I'd kind of. I was surprised before us last night that he wasn't in the game as much, but then there was two big moments where he could have made a big difference, uh, like he did in the semi-final against St. Johnson. You know, when we, we look at the situation with Jota, and I was just saying before that things were a bit tense and we escaped a win. I think there were, though, passages of play, Jim, that were in keeping with this philosophy that Ange has. I mean, at one point, Jota and Turnbull exchanged back heels First time I've ever seen that, you know, mm-hmm. and it was a beautiful move, but there was a there was an end product. It's not as though they were just showboating for the sake of it. And I also mm-hmm. think that um, I've been a big critic of us playing the ball out of the back. Now, that's not to say I just want people to put their toe through the ball, but there's been occasions this season, quite a few occasions, where we've put ourselves under unnecessary pressure. However, last night, and with Starfelt and Welsh starting that game, I wasn't sure how they would they would fare. Last night, I thought they played that game almost to a T. There was no moments where it was heart and mouth kind of stuff. We were still playing it out from the back, unless I've missed one that, that, that is obvious. But I thought it was very comfortable to play it out from the back last night. So although I'm saying there's a side to Angie's game where we maybe slow things down, it's not as intense and we win the game, I still think there was some great passages to play last night, Tony. I was just mentioning at the gym there that, that at one point Jota and, and Turnbull exchanged the back heels um, mm. on one move gone down the left. And the way that we're playing the ball out from the back, I thought it worked perfectly last night. Yeah, I listen, I, I didn't actually think that they were in any real danger. I know Hearts had that wee flurry in the second half. And I think I get back to it that, that, and that caused a lot of anxiety and tension in the stadium amongst the fans, but I think the players felt pretty comfortable in dealing with it. You know, Starfield came back in as if he'd never been away. I mean, he was absolutely terrific. You know, he, he got his head to everything. He, You know, he was even, I think at one point, he was manhandled out the road by yes. the Halkett, which again was another booking. And he, and he still managed to win the header, yet... Bobby Madden doesn't deem that one a foul or, or a booking, you know, and he's not like thrown to the deck, but he still managed to win the header. So he, you know, he did his job, and I, I thought they were they were comfortable last night, you know. And I, I, I get that the the one 0 lead was precarious. It's always precarious, but again, I get back to it. It's not as if Joe Hart was pulling off save after save. Big Gordon had a few diving saves. Mm. When you know Celtic had shots at goal, peppered the the the, the goal with shots. So you know there there was some decent passages of play. Roderick involved and McGregor involved in most of that. You know Jota was quiet by his really high standards. Diogo just he's just a pest. He's just a nuisance. And again he's come up with a moment that mattered. Fourteen goals, twenty two appearances. That, that's phenomenal. Uh, scoring rate. He's he's now the. Scottish Premiership's top marksman, so you can't ask for any more from him, you know. So in in, in various pockets of the park, I, I thought we were, I thought we were comfortable. Not that the league suggests that in any shape or form, but I, I didn't feel the whole, you know, sharp and take a breath that the supporters were feeling. I, I really didn't. I, I thought well, they were controlling it quite well. Hearts had their spell, but I never thought they were going to score. You know, you, you mentioned a couple of things here I want to pick up on. The first one was uh, the bookings or lack of. Now, I think it is important. I don't want to bore anybody by talking about referees, but see last night when you watch that game, it doesn't matter if you're a Celtic fan or a neutral, and you look at the amount of fouls, um, both given and not given, from Hearts and against Celtic, and you consider that only one player was booked in that game, and it was Adam Montgomery. How Peter I, I find that astonishing. 
how Peter Haring never get booked is, is beyond me. Boyce reason, as well. Yeah, and Boyce. Reason, uh, and the reason he never get booked was because if he wants he's booked them, he's going to come at another one and you're going to have to send them off. So that's why Peter Haring never get booked. But he, he was a persistent fowler. The same way Alex Gogic was a persistent fowler on Rogic at Easter Road. They get away with absolute murder. And I I thought Bobby Madden last night, and I'm I'm not one for conspiracies and, and blaming referees, but I thought Bobby Madden was shocking for both teams last night. Both teams, not just Celtic, he was shocking for both teams. It was just an utterly inept display of, of officiating. And and he, he managed to unite both sets and supporters and condemning them because he was brutal. Mm. Bobby Madden's what supposed to be one of our best referees. He was shocking last night. And I think the Aberdeen fans agree with us as well. Jim, I'm going to give it a different angle. We are struggling big time with injuries here. Like, you know, and in previous shows, I've listed six what I would have called red card challenges that went unpunished against Celtic players. One of which probably finished McCarthy off in the Dundee United game because he didn't reappear for the second half. But my big concern is you look at Ralston. Now, I know that by the time Ralston goes off, it's maybe a muscle strain, right? But on two occasions last night in the first half, as Tony rightly said, one of them was, you know, within the first couple of minutes, he takes a dullion, um, to use an old expression. And I think what happens is, right, it's not bad enough to injure you so that you have to go off the park, but it impairs you for the rest of the game or the rest of your involvement in that game to such a degree that you're relying on other parts of your body and therefore there is a higher chance that you might strain uh, a muscle elsewhere. And we've seen three muscle strains last night. So on the one hand, you've got Ralston, that initial challenge that Tony mentioned, plus when he shoots over the bar and he screams at Madden, that's because he's been he's been taken out um, as, he, as he shapes to shoot, um, to use a Celtic TV phrase. And eventually he goes off injured. And, and I think that my biggest concern is the protection of our players because we really can ill afford another big injury list. <clears throat> I would take away all the conspiracy theories. I was just asking, mm-hmm. are they fit for purpose, these referees? Mm-hmm. Uh, what kind of standard are they meant to get to? Uh, are they performance appraised or that kind of stuff? I just I just think we've got a whole batch of really, really poor referees. I think they're extremely inconsistent. I don't think there's any consequences <coughs> when they make these mistakes. Uh, I think they treat things differently. And again, without trying to get any conspiracy theories, it was a game... It was a game at Ibrox where Hibs came calling and Portis got sent off. And, and I saw it on Twitter and I'm looking at it from various angles and I'm thinking, was it a foul in the first place? If it was a foul, was it, was it a yellow card? Uh, if it was, a, was, it, was it even a, even a red card? So I, I was un, unsure and the guy got a red card and you think, all right, fair enough. That was one of the options there that he could have given. And then somebody posted another tackle, I think it was Lundstrom did in the third minute of the game. And it was worse, <laughs> worse than the Porte tackle. They didn't give a foul. So my concern is basically the lack of inconsistency. And if you've got inconsistency, then what are the consequences for that? And one of the things we looked at last season, one particular team got quite a, a number of retrospective red cards. Uh, that system is just daft in terms of you know how a referee can miss something dead obvious <laughs> that's then sorted out retrospectively and there's no consequences for that referee. Therefore, they can be as incompetent, they can be as inconsistent as they want. Mm. And one of the other things that's been, you know, obviously it's been raised before, that uh, if Tony fancied being a referee, uh, he could be a season ticket holder at Celtic Park one day and then chuck that and be a referee for a Celtic game the next day. Now, that's the system, and uh, I don't think there's any other system in Europe that's like that. Penalty uh, to Celtic. Absolutely. And I think you've got something you've talked about before, Paul, was that kind of unconscious bias. Yeah. And in a split second decision, you have to be unconsciously biased. Of course you have. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the thing that capped it all for me was the incident where that referee two or three seasons ago at Ibrox, where there was four potential red cards against one of their players and and he did nothing about it. And then that night he's in a boozer celebrating with the fans. And the total lack of self-awareness of that. And that should have been a watershed moment in Scottish football. That's when Celtic should have stood up and said, hold on, there's something not right here. Mm. Right. Irrespective of where you think there's a conspiracy theory 
or anything, you can't have a system whereby you can be a season ticket holder one day and then next week you're refereeing that team's game. That just does not make sense. And I think there have to be consequences for what happens. Another thing that kind of annoys me is that you can't do this kind of uh, sort of kind of like knee-jerk reactions to things. There has to be some sort of body of evidence. And I read Alan Morrison, I think it was again, because he does a lot of really good stuff. And he looked at, you know, some key decisions that have went teams' way. And I think we got a few and the league leaders got a few. And I think after some like nine games, he'd deduced that there was some like four points that went in their favour that really shouldn't have went in their favour. Yeah. Four points after a quarter of the season, multiply that's 12 points a season. So that's pretty significant in a season where uh, it could be tight. I think all I am saying is I think they need to change the system whereby you have to declare which team you support and therefore you'll referee their games. I think there has to be consequences if you make mistakes. Uh, if you keep making the same mistakes, then you have to be demoted. I think there has to be a system whereby you assess your referees against a certain standard. I don't know what that is, so I'm showing my ignorance here. But if we've got a group of referees who are not up to a certain standard, then they shouldn't be refereeing top flight games because they're incompetent to do so. Therefore, you then... You have to bring in maybe referees from other countries who are not, you know, maybe playing games on the same days because the referees you have are not competent enough. And I think we've seen enough this season not to understand. Another thing we had I think, years ago, I think referees were allowed to come out and explain things. And I think that kind of got to a stage where it was a bit fast, so we stopped doing that. But it'd be good to know referees' interpretations of the games. And I think as fans, you're obviously biased. I mean, you're looking at your team and thinking, well, it's my team. But there have been some decisions this season and right at the first game of the season the holiday tackle on McGregor where I think it was Madden wasn't it? Yeah it was Madden's, yeah. Madden's, he's, he's, he's 10 yards away and mm -hmm. he's watching that and it wasn't even a yellow card and he'll ref the other games where he'll give he'll give red cards and much much less than that so yeah. what are the consequences for that? Uh, I always remember the first or one of the first games I, I was conscious of Bobby Madden refereeing the games was the game it the Glasgow Derby, where was it? Was it Clint Hill? What was that his name? Clint Hill. Yeah, yeah, Clint yes, Hill yes. brought down Griffiths in the last minute. And after the game, Bobby Madden said, I haven't looked at it again. I'll actually give him a penalty. I think that was unconscious bias. You know, that in the split second, the last minute of the game, no, I'm not going to give that. I don't mm -hmm. know that for sure. Obviously, I don't know that for sure. But, and, and I'm trying to come away from the conspiracy theories because this, it does no one any good. I just think we need a system in there that's, that's, that's a transparent system. People understand how it works. I think VAR will certainly help things. Uh, VAR would have helped last night in terms of putting that issue to bed. But I think football it's so fast these days. Mm -hmm. And I think when you've got a decision like last night, and the reason that we're talking about it so much, it was so tight. You know, if he was two yards offside, you could say he's two yards offside. Yeah. It was so tight. And I've been a linesman at, at, at youth games, not very many, maybe half a dozen games, and it's really, really difficult. So on the one hand, you've got one team are pushing out, one team are pushing up. And if you're a linesman, you're looking across that line, there's a multitude of players all moving about, and the ball's moving about as well. And there's a lot of fans maybe don't understand the offside rule that. It's just the ball you have to be behind. You can be 10 yards in front of the opposition, but as long as you're behind that ball. And there wasn't much in it last night. So if he'd have given it offside, I'd have said, fair enough. If he didn't give it, I'd have said, fair enough. It wasn't clear cut. But this is a rather long-winded answer to say. I just think... We need VAR in anyway. I mean, VAR won't solve everything, but even if it solves 90% of the stuff, last night been a good example. And as long as it's applied consistently and transparently as well, as long as we know how mm. it works, you know, that concern I have is that people uh, away from the game are actually making decisions and you think, how did they come to that decision? Uh, so VAR for me to come in to make life a bit better, I think the standard is poor. I don't know what they're doing about the standard being poor. I don't know what the teams are doing. Uh, I mean, certainly last night, the Celtic fans were on the boat, Bobby Madden, as were the Hearts fans at one yeah. point as well. And Robbie Nielsen didn't look too happy after the game, although I think his ire was about the, was about the goal, as opposed to other things. So, so really poor performance, and not for the first time we've seen referees in the SPFL just, uh, you know, not, up, just not applying the rules as you would like to see them being applied and then being inconsistent. Uh, the things you were mentioning, Paul, about muscle injuries and all this kind of stuff, if it's a yellow card, it's a yellow card. If it's not a yellow card, it's not a yellow card. So I just think we need better referees than we have at the moment. How the SFA do that, I've got no idea. But but basically, there's there's, there's you know there's millions of pounds at stake here, tens of millions of pounds at stake yes. here. Mm -hmm. uh, 
on mm. big decisions. Mm. And the thing I'd like to change, I know I'm hogging this, Tony, sorry, is that I hate the penalty law. I've, I've always hated the penalty law because to me, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. Right? So the punishment is an unimpeded shot to goal from 12 yards. So for me, that has to be the crime. It has to be a, a goal-scoring opportunity because for me, nine times out of ten, a penalty kick uh, is a foul inside the box. It's a direct free kick. That's the rule I would change because you look at, you know, I'll pick, I'll pick, I'll pick one at random with, with a game at Easter Road last year, uh, the 2-2 game. Uh, we have got a penalty, Martin Boyle, where the ball was kind of at, at the... At the, at the intersection of the of the of the byline in the penalty box, and Martin Boy's going away from goals. <clears throat> Scott Brown barges into him. It's a foul, definite foul. But since he the box, so it's a penalty. Like right? he's never going to score from that position. Mm-hmm. So how does the punishment fit the crime for there? So for me, if it's an obvious goal score opportunity, either in or outside the box, to me that's a penalty. Uh, because another, another phrase you hear all the time is when a foul appears, when a foul happens in the box, people say. Anybody else in the pitch, that's a foul. So it's a foul then, so you have to give it. But if you give a foul, then it's a penalty. And penalties are game-changing decisions, as we saw the other night. As we saw at the Livingston game, it should have been a game-changing decision. And it's such a big decision, it makes it much more and more difficult. So I'd, I'd like to change that rule, but nobody's going to change that rule. It just lets you better referees. No, I like your rationale behind that, Jim, to be honest. I think that uh, there's a lot of rules you take for granted you never question. They've been there... Um, since your dot. So that, that is an interesting one. I just want to say to everyone, uh, I really appreciate everybody getting involved. We're about 1,000 live on the bulletin today. I'm sitting in uh, Laura Bradburn's chair for today, but Laura will be involved in the weekender. The charity weekender starts at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. And I've got to say that if you were to look at the fundraising page, a link for which is under the video, it will tell you that we have currently got £3,290 raised of a £10,000 goal. But I have been informed that we have just had a donation of £10,000 from JB EMS, and that takes our current total to £13,290 before we kick a ball. Does that mean I'm taking the weekend off, seeing how we've got a target? Of course it doesn't. We've got 1,500, we've got 15 podcasts. There's about 1,500 Celtic podcasts, but we've got 15 of them. They're all involved. The Axon team are involved. We've got some other footage that uh, we've pre-recorded that we're going to throw in as well. And we're going to go out for 24 hours over Saturday and Sunday this weekend. Following that, We'll keep the fundraiser alive because we're going to have a number of auctions, etc. And we'll keep it open for maybe another seven days or so to raise as much money as we possibly can uh, for the two parishes of St Mary's and St Alphonsus who desperately need funds. Uh, They really are uh, desperate in their pursuit of some much-needed funds at this time of the year, not only for their own uh, churches but for all the community work that they do all year round. And, uh, yeah, I was surprised to hear that they were in dire straits. And as Celtic supporters, I've been blown away by the response to uh, the fundraiser, which I think we only posted a couple of days ago. Um, But already we have burst through the £10,000 goal. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for every single penny that's been donated. Tremendous. We were talking about refs there, Tony. Um, you will be joining us at some point over the weekend, Tony Haggerty. We're talking about refs. The only yellow that was given last night was given to Adam Montgomery. And I want to talk about Montgomery because I thought he played particularly well when he came on. He comes on, having probably not had a kick of the ball for a few weeks. Um, it allows us to put Zhiranovic at right back, which is his preferred position. And I thought Montgomery played particularly well when he came in. What's your thoughts about Adam Montgomery and how he's developing? I think, unlike Mikey Johnson, there's a player in Adam Montgomery and he's worth persevering with. And I think he's clearly listening to the manager and things are sinking in. Because having not played a lot of football, he came on and deputised really well last night. I thought he was really unlucky to uh, be booked. You know, I think Bobby Madden eventually just, you know, said he had to book someone. And it's easier to book a young kid like that who's not going to give him any back chat, is it? You know, so he just flashed a yellow card and in his general direction, which I thought was a bit, a bit off of Bobby Madden, considering Haring and Boyce and others got away with murder all evening. Uh, and I'll go back to what Jim said. They're just 
they're just no fit for purpose for Scottish referees. They really are poor, you know. But I think enough's been said about them. But uh, Montgomery, uh, Montgomery fills me with great hope. You know that he can be another young guy like Ralston who can make an impact in the team. You know, you you look at him and you know you when he came on, I didn't uh, have any qualms about him coming on and doing a job. I didn't think, oh no, Montgomery's coming on. That that's mm. Well, that's a weak link. We could get exposed down down the flank. I, I was safe as houses, and he, you know, and and he justified the faith the manager had in, in putting him on. And uh, you know, he, he he's a young guy. He's shown eagerness and willingness to learn, and uh, he's contributing. Yeah, you know, he came on at Petodre and set up the goal for Jota that sparked off the the run, the current domestic run they're on. You know, so the pennies dropped with Montgomery. You know, mm. just. Whenever I get my chance, I need to impress, and he's listening. And and as a youngster, that's all you can do: absorb it all like a sponge, take it all in. And when you get that opportunity, give the manager a wee selection headache for the next game. Yeah. I think Montgomery certainly did that. Mikey Johnston hasn't done that. You know, if you're going to compare and contrast the two, and uh, and I and I like Montgomery. I like his attitude. I like his application. I like his effort. You know, and and, he, and there's no shortage of of young talent there, young raw talent. And uh, yeah, fair play to him. I, I think that when you look at him, um, he's deceptively strong because he looks fairly slight um, in build. And, and this season, Jim, I think the only game that he's probably not impressed was against Dundee United. I, I think he had an, odd, an off day that day. But generally, I'm pretty confident with Montgomery if we need to utilise him. I like him a lot. Yeah, I do agree with Tony. I think he's a, he's 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 also willing to take risks. <clears throat> he's also willing to cut inside and take take players on. And I thought uh, I thought Ange made a mistake in the Bayern game when he brought on Johnson on the left. I thought that was ideal for Montgomery because we're having to defend and, and Montgomery can get back and he can defend. I, I think he's uh, he's been really good. Uh, he's been a real find this season, and I have no qualms keeping him at left back if uh, Tony Ralph is going to be out for a while. Yeah. I, and he gets forward. I just like him. I think there was a, maybe a chance last night. He could have maybe had a wee dig at one point. I think was that was that last night. Was it last night? Cracking up. Uh, <laughs> aye. So I'd like to see him come a bit. He's obviously he's good. He's, he's excellent coming forward. Mm. And maybe his best position is maybe a kind of wide midfield on the left. Maybe uh, something like that. Uh, so yeah, I've got I've got no qualms about Adam Montgomery. He's been really good and uh, happy for him to be in the team as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you're welcome back, Jim. You've got a fan base out there who are welcoming you back into the show. That's good, Jim. DV Boy on uh, YouTube. First half, we were superb. Then it developed into one of the games. But three points, I don't care if it's ugly. Keep them coming, Ange. I think that under the circumstances and having lost three of your starters, um, we did particularly well to uh, maintain uh, a level of intensity and domination throughout the game. Uh, you just need to look at the possession, uh, the shots on goal, 25, only five on target. Um, to, to then look at our centre-half position, I think, is something that uh, is another slight concern. I mean, going into these games, Tony, I'm going to stop saying, what if he gets injured? Because invariably it happens. Um, and I'm going to stop saying it because it's happened this season a few times. Now, when we're looking at the centre-half situation as a whole, I think uh, quite a few of us were surprised that Cameron Carter-Vickers was left out last night for personal reasons. Um, the sooner Cameron comes back, the better, because I think he's the most dominant centre-half that we have. It was then a toss-up for me after that because I'm a big fan of Stephen Welsh and I think he's done well this season. But then I look at what Starfield done last season, uh, sorry, last night, uh, and I was very impressed with them. Um, so I wonder uh, also with regards to the Julien situation, Tony, and that being a concern, is this still a position that you feel we need to strengthen come January, centre-half, even though we do have um, quite a few bodies in the building? Um, I'm not sure. You know, last night showed you again, one injury and you're playing beat on at centre-half. Yeah, you, you cannot get enough good players in your team, right? In my, my opinion, right? So go and get a good centre-half, right? Because you will need them. The bottom line, right? So go and get a, a seven, eight, nine performer a week. Whoever that is, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but Angel will know, right? That's what he's paid for. That's what the scout system's paid for to, to find these kind of guys, right? The Julian thing concerns me because he was very cut the other day when he was asked about Julian. Mm. And he said, nothing new on that, nothing to report. I'll let you know when there is. First time he'd said, because for a while it had been that he was back in training, 
he was back on the on the grass and all that, and it was all very positive. And then it was just a big negative shutdown the other day. So that, in the back of my mind, that was concerning because on the 30th of December, that'll be a full calendar year that Julian's been missing, right? So that's maybe a concern. So if that doesn't tell you you're on the centre half, then nothing nothing will. I like Welsh. Again, like Montgomery, I think there's a player there, young, young raw talent, learning his trade. But Starfelt last night, I thought, stepped up to the plate. He did. That was his best game in a Celtic jersey. I did the man by man's last night and I toyed with giving him a nine because I really did think he was dominant. From the minute that Halkett threw him to the floor and he still won the header, he, he said to himself, right, I'm up for this. And he showed him. I, I used, funnily enough, Jim used the word ungainly. I used that and my man managed him. He looks ungainly at times. Well, ball at his feet now and again, but he still does the job. And you know what? Unlike Kyogo, Kyogo settles straight away, right? He just, everything fell into place for Kyogo. It takes time for other people. You know, Starfelt being one of them, come from a different uh, culture of football. You know, he's a Swede, he was playing in Russia, different style. You know, call it what you like, but he's taking time to adapt, yeah. taking time to adapt to the message and philosophy and style of the new manager. All of these things maybe looked like he was struggling fish out of water and stuff at the start, but the pennies dropped. That was a guy who had missed the last five games. You would never have thought he'd missed the last five games on last night's performance. He was outstanding. And you, again, I go back to it that, yeah, they might have won 1-0, but I never felt at any minute that Starfelt or any of the guys at the back of the pack were going to make a rickets of it. And they were up against guys who were putting themselves about, mm. a team that were putting themselves mm. about, and they withstood it. You know, so there is that resilience that I'm talking about. There's character. There's, you know, they can mix it. You know, and, and uh, I think a lot of Celtic supporters were delighted with Starfelt last night because they were maybe worried what they were going to get coming back in after five games missing. Solid, dependable, reliable, and uh, yeah, you when uh, Carter Vickers is back, you, you've got to pay him two from those three. But I still think for an extra insurance policy that. You would be wise to go and sign a central defender in January because you saw what happened last night. Two defenders went off the park. Yes. Based on minutes. And we are still squad depth as light. So go and get a good centre half, especially when you ha- you cannot put a definitive on when Julian's returning. Well, I'm going to ask you about that, John. I'm going to tap into your experience of being in press rooms and, and speaking to managers who are often... Um, you know, the emotions of the game are still running high. I, I sometimes get the impression they don't want to be there uh, to talk to the press straight after a game. And I, I was looking at that situation where uh, before the game, he's asked about Julian and he was very cut in his response for the first time. Yeah. And on the one hand, I'm asking myself, is it because he's sick of answering the question about Julian or has the situation changed and he's simply not looking to share that at this point. Well, what was your take on it? What was your gut? Two ways to look at it. He might be sick of answering that question, but as I said, in the lead up to the other day, it was all very positive and we were getting kind of, without definitives, we were getting kind of loose. You know, he'll be back playing by end of November, beginning of December, Christmas time, festive period. All of a sudden, it gets shut down. Like, it was just like, this, you know, small fire. It was extinguished mm. and that was it. And I, and I thought, you know what? There's maybe something there that he doesn't want to share at this minute in time. Could be reading too much into it. Into it, But, you know, experience tells you that, you know, if it's positive, you you rab it away, don't you? You say, oh, Julian, we're penciling him in for this and that. If it's negative and you don't want people to know, you put <clears throat> it down and you don't want to answer it. And it was, it's a fairly... You know, it's a it's a warmer upper or question, isn't it? It's a wee shot into the goalie's hands from six yards to give him a feel of the ball. You know, that kind of thing. It is, but isn't it? And and the cut reply spoke well. It's quite surprising. Yeah. It was surprising, mm. you know, and it's uh, and a lot of the time press guys know this, journalists know it, a lot of the time it's what's not said that speaks mm-hmm. volumes as opposed to what is said. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. so I, I, I kinda read it both ways. Hope I'm wrong. But, uh, I, I think mm-hmm. we've been unlucky with centre-halves. I think we've been unlucky with, with centre-halves over a period of time. Mm-hmm. You can go as far back as John Kennedy with his injury, but in, in recent years, Simunovic, you know, I, I thought 
there was a point where he had a lot of potential. Benkovic, I always thought that might have turned into a permanent transfer. Injuries curtailed these Celtic careers. Uh, and I'm concerned that that was Julian as well, Jim. How big a loss would he be if that's the case? I'm not sure, to be perfectly honest. I, I think we're a, <coughs> we're a really nice team, I think. Mm. And I think our centre-backs are really nice. <laughs> Carter Vickers and stuff, I think they're nice guys. And you want your centre-half to be kind of nasty guys. And I just think they lack a wee bit of height. I think they're both great. Don't get me wrong. I think I said I've been pretty consistent with Starfield. I think he's a good defender. And Carter Vickers, one of these guys, you don't notice them in games, and that's a good sign for a defender. If you don't notice a defender, you know he's playing well. My concern is that set pieces are going to be, because of the fine margins this year, I mean, we lost a game at Tynecastle to a set piece. We lost a game at Ibrox to a set piece. Uh, You've also got to look at your centre half. It's been good offensively. We get loads of corners in games and we hardly score any goals. You're looking for your centre half to score goals in those games. And again, because it's basically like a head to head this season against our biggest rivals, their centre half <laughs> to me look, 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 look more like centre halves. You know, they're big and they're kind of nasty and they won't mess about and they'll score goals and they'll, and they'll put, their, put their foot in here and their head in there. And I just think our guys lack a wee bit of physicality. Julian gives us that physicality. But I think he's too nice as well. I just think, you know, which is not a bad thing in life to have, to be to be too nice. But I think for a centre half, you want him to be, you know, maybe a wee bit less nice, playing within the rules, obviously. But uh, and we need to have more of a threat offensively, and we haven't had that because I'm trying to think. Apart from his uh, the long shot that Carter Vickers had, I don't think he scored a goal with with a header. I don't think Starfield has he. Scored a goal with a header. I think Welsh maybe he's scored. Never a, scored. Was... Staff felt no. He's never scored yet. Welsh, Welsh was that against Hearts, didn't he? Or was that yeah, last season? Cup, cup tie. You know. Cup tie. He's not scored a header against. It was a cup tie. Yeah. Cup tie. So, so, so basically, for the amount of corners we get, I think we should score more goals. And who's going to score goals from the corners? The biggest guys in the team, and they're not that big. At the end of the day, so I think there's an issue in there. I would agree. If you could take another centre half, somebody's got a bit more physicality because Welsh also isn't the tallest, you know. So I just think we maybe we were a bit too nice at times, maybe lucky about physicality. And I think the game in the second of January might be decided by set pieces, you mm. know. And 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 a wee best. I mean, nothing's going to change. We're not going to get something before the second of January, but that would be one of my concerns going into that game because that's what losses the game last time. There was nothing in the game last time. He said peace lost the game. So uh, in terms of to answer the question, yeah, I think we do another centre half in there, something with a bit of physicality. He's somebody who can who can defend. But then again, you think, well, he has to be Ange's type of player as well. Because I kind of felt, I still feel as if Starfield isn't an Ange type player because he does look quite ungainly. But he's a good defender. So do we go after somebody who's a, just an out and out defender or somebody who can play the Ange game? And I'd imagine Ange wants somebody who can play his game. The, the immediate one that springs to your mind is John Shooter. Because you could get him yeah. for nothing because he's uh, available uh, to talk to clubs from Christmas onwards, January onwards. You know, John shooter has got a track record, an injury track record, but he's starting to find some for him back in the Scotland squad. And he, he would give you a height presence, Jim. <coughs> I think he's... I think a, the thing about Suter is somebody who, who's actually playing in the league and, and, and knows what the league's about. And he's yeah. a good young player, Suter. Yeah. Uh, but he's a, a young guy. I, I, I'd always go for more experienced... People, somebody who is, you know, like uh, who can who walk into the team. Somebody who's who's got a bit of a a, a, a bit of a past. I think so. To me, because he's a bit young. I think could walk into the team, though. Uh, to be fair, you know. Do you so, see much uh, difference between Suter and Welsh? He, well, on the balance, I would say Suter's a better player than Welsh. I don't think there's much in it. I think I think I'm, yes, I think he's a better player. Yeah. I don't think there's much in it, and that's why I think. I mean. I, I would tend to. I, don't know if you I, get, was, I could get him for nothing. Oh well, yeah, if you get him for nothing, great. He'd be, he'd be no, a good player within the squad. Yeah. I'm not so sure he would be. If you everyone fit, would you play Suter in front of Julian, Carter, Vickers, and Starfield? I'm possibly. not so sure I would. Possibly. And you, I mean, you know what? Possibly you would definitely. I, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm the I mean, up to the manager. It's a nice dilemma. It's a nice dilemma to pick. Yeah, I think you have to pick other school defenders. To be fair. Yeah, I think in any football team, it's good to know what your best 11 are. You know, and you, and you bring in somebody, like, he's, he's, he's definitely my centre half. And at the moment, mm. you're thinking, when all four of them are fit Carter Vickers, Starfield, Julian, Welsh, who's your definite first two? I'm not that sure. 
That, that's the thing, because I think the question mark around Julian is what are we getting if and when he comes back? At this moment in time, as big a fan of Welsh as I am, and I definitely am, I think it's Carter Vickers and Starfield yeah. at this moment in time. Um, and I hope that we see more performances like we did last night from Starfield. I really do. Uh, because, you know, there is that uh, period of uh, a player adapting to the Scottish game tour. Yeah. yeah, it's a great point. I mean, one of the best centre halves I've ever seen at Celtic was Paul Elliott, and it took him a while to adapt to the speed yeah, yeah. of the game. Uh, I think he got 16 bookings or something in his first season. Um, Are they not on the trot? Yeah. That, I've spoken about that before. Remember, shoot, did that, you are the ref. That's right. They gave you a scenario, <laughs> and then they gave you A, B, C, or D, and the D was always book Paul Elliott. <laughs> that was always the last day. Uh, that was always I think the also thing. the fact that, that when you had Elliott, you would say he's. He's definitely playing. He's our best player. Oh, yeah. Van Dijk, you say, he's our player. He's definitely playing. So when you have players, you think that's it. I don't think we have that just now. I think we have a few players and it's hard to pick the best two. And it'd be good to get into a position whereby we think he's our best centre half. He will play all the time. We don't actually have that yet. No, that's a good point. One final uh, area of the park I want to talk about is um, the, the creativity of Tommy Rogic was back on show last night. I mean... In terms of ball retention, how often do you see him almost losing the ball? But uh, you know, there's some kind of magnetic appeal uh, between his boots and the ball, and it comes back to him. He's unreal. Uh, I was a wee bit surprised. I thought it was a good opportunity last night, Tony. If you're bringing Tommy Rogic back in to stick with McCarthy and give David Turnbull a rest, uh, but we've ran with the two players who are very similar in terms of their position on the park. Did that surprise you? It seems to be Angie's go-to. He does like to play Turnbull and Rogic. Yeah, yeah, he likes Turnbull and Rodgick because they've not let him down. I uh, was a surprise to see McCarthy uh, bombed out the squad. Yeah, I was, actually, to be fair, because I didn't think he did an awful lot wrong against uh, Aberdeen. But if if Rodgick plays, then Turnbull is playing alongside him in, in Andy's mind. So that's fair enough. And you'd never question the manager's decision because he, he'll not change it anyway. So that's the way he wants to play. But there was a moment last night when Tom Rodgick actually fell on the floor still managed to play a pass. I think there were three challenges were put in on him and he, was, he went down in his yeah. helmet and he had the ball and there was guys round about him and the next thing, he played it out wide right and I thought, how did you do that? I mean, you just say the, the, the magnetic boots. You know, and Tom Rogic just gives you real dynamism now and I, I've been a critic of Tom Rogic. This is a Tom Rogic. This is the player I always thought was in Tom Rogic. And he just didn't do it consistently enough. This season has been Tom Rodgers' most consistent season, arguably, in all his time at Celtic. I said that you could pick out isolated moments of skill and brilliant goals, but you could never pick out Tom Rodgers, a DVD of Tom Rodgers' best games. You could this season, because yeah. he's bossed quite a few. Last night he was terrific. Against Hibs he was terrific for that, for that 40 minutes. He never even finished that game. You know, in, in other games this season, he's come on and made a valid contribution for Todry. Mm-hmm. He puts Adam Gummery in to slide it across for Jota. Telling contributions consistently. And Tom Rodgick's been that man this season. And uh, I don't know, again, I get back to the manager. He's compatriot who has just said to him, Tom, there's nothing I can teach you about football. You're a wonderfully gifted, talented footballer. Show them. You know, you know do it for yourself more than anybody. And, you know, Tom Rodgick should never have lasted 90 minutes last night. But he did. You know, that's a side to Tom Rodgick. You've not seen that stamina side. And by all rights, he should have been hooked because he's on back in gently. Yeah. I'm saying in the aftermatch last night, it was good to get him 90 minutes and he was good that he lasted. Brilliant that he lasted. And he, and he is, he's a, he, he is real, he's a real talented footballer. You know, there is something about him and something about Celtic under Ange with Tom Rodgick and the team that he's getting, up a, he, he's getting a tune out of him. And I think that's brilliant man management. Get a tune out of Ralston, get a tune out of Tom Rodgick. Two, two of the best bits of man management that, that uh, Anne Postacoglu has performed this season. Mm-hmm. Real Jedi mind trick stuff, as I've said before. But, mm-hmm. you know, because Rodgick was on his way out the door. You know, out, out the back the exit door at the start of the season until yes. Anne comes in and says to him, nah, nah, you're going nowhere. You can play in my team. Here's why. And he's shown you why. And, yeah, and, and, and someone like me is slowly but surely changed my tune on Rodgick because I now see where he fits into the team but 
he needed a manager to tell to tell him where he fits into the team and his role. Because I used to think that he just he was a kind of Peter Mandelson under other managers. He was a midfielder without portfolio, and now and again we just produce a top draw goal, and people confuse that with being a fantastic footballer. Whereas now I am seeing a fantastic footballer, the whole package who can do a lot. See when you look at yeah. the, his career at Celtic, Jim, and he, he comes in as a little-known Australian, mm-hmm. and he doesn't make an impact in Neil Lennon's side because it was Lennon's first tenure when when Rodrick signs. We loan him out because he wants to get back into the the frame for the Australian uh, World Cup, I think it was at the time. So we loan him back to Australia. He comes back as a bit a bit part player. He then starts making an impact, uh, and he makes an impact under Ronnie Daly. It looked as though he had peaked under Brendan Rodgers. And I mean, that moment, which is written in the folklore of Celtic now, um, to clinch the treble treble, uh, is Tommy Rodgers' moment. And that was the one that we thought we were going to look back on. And I thought we'd seen the best of Tommy Rodgers. Had we? Are we now seeing the best of Tommy Rodgers? He's another nice guy, isn't he? he doesn't, co- doesn't, doesn't, doesn't cause any trouble, just gets on with the game. Like in a model pro, I think. He's a magician. Basically, the things he does with the ball, you think, what? And it's just great. Question you posed before was, was with McCarthy. I think any game at Celtic Park, you don't play home midfield players. And that's why Turnbull has to play, or Roger has to play, McGregor has to play. I, I, I don't like playing people like McCarthy or Beaton at home. I think we should be on the front foot going for it. And I think that by by playing the McCarthys and the Beatons in the midfield, we play even slower. And that's the point I made at the very start of the podcast. I think we have to play quicker. Uh, as far as Roger's concerned, he's a magician. Uh, I'd like to see him score more goals. I'd like to see him shoot a bit more because he's got a fantastic show on him. You know, so he, has he has he has he scored this season? Don't think he has. I'm trying to remember there. So a bit more goals from Tommy Rogie, but he's he's an absolute magician and he's been great and and long may that continue. That, that's the irony with Tom Rogic. The player, the, the old player I was talking about, scored more goals, but wasn't mm. the old player. And then mm. this new full player has added all sorts to his armory. Which one scoring. do you want, Tony? Which which one do you want? I want them both because I'm greedy. Okay. That greedy, okay. I'm liking the look of him as he is now. I've got to say, I think yeah, that he's contributing he more yeah, I mean. across the board. And and he will score goals because, as Jim said, uh, there, there will come a point where he he will have that dig and he'll because he can do it. It's in his locker, you know. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the rise of Tommy Rogic. Listen, we've actually ran over an hour, gentlemen. It's. Uh, coming up to one hour and eight minutes. I'm going to thank everybody for getting involved in the fundraiser during the show. Uh, so we are now sitting at 13,340 quid, which is unbelievable. It's an incredible amount. I was talking to St Mary's the other day. They said that if we were able to raise something in the region of £5,000, it would be a game changer for them. And we're sitting here before we even start the, the actual weekend at nine o'clock tomorrow, uh, and we're already sitting at 13,340. Thank you, everybody, for your contributions. And thanks for everybody contributing to the comment section and watching us on various platforms. We were hitting a 1,000 live, which is brilliant on a Friday afternoon when we're chatting about the rip-roaring Tony Haggerty. Um, <laughs> yes, join us for the, the weekender. There's going to be a variety of different content starting at 9 o'clock in the morning through to 9 at night, both on Saturday and Sunday. Loads of Celtic chat, of course. We better pre-produce stuff. You'll enjoy the Tony Curran interview. Tony is a lovely, lovely guy and a big Celtic fan who has supported Axom for some time now. He was massive in the, the weekend or last year and we're going to be putting his interview out this weekend as well and you will enjoy it. As well as a wee bit of music here and there and various other interviews. But the collaborations with other Celtic podcasts, that's always the fun bit uh, because you never actually know what you're going to get. But there's a, a huge uh, amount of talent out there and hopefully we can um, showcase some of it to Axon viewers for the first time. There's a couple of newer podcasts coming on board. So really looking forward to it. All that's left for me to say is thank you again to Jim Moore and to Tony Haggerty for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. 